In this episode, we discuss the biggest misconceptions about policy loans that many people believe when they get started with the infinite banking concept. She's Holly, and she helps people find financial freedom. He's Nate. He makes sense out of money. This is Dollars and Nonsense. If you follow the herd, you will be slaughtered. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. It's so so fun to do this. So fun to have you guys uh, today, Holly. We're talking about something we've talked about before. So this is this is not exactly brand new um, information. But we have what like 160 some episodes now out. Yes. So you know it's been a it's been a little while since we've brought this up. And the reason why we feel like it's always important to bring this up is because when someone is introduced to the infinite banking concept, it's very common to get uh, stuck believing things that actually are not true about the, all of the policy loan situation that that you'll end up so borrowing from policies repaying policies all of that there, there can be so many there's if you go online you have a whole bunch of uh well, misinformation out there i feel like <laughs> that then or uh about policy loans it's, i think it's the biggest stumbling block policy loans and premiums understanding those two pieces is by far the hardest to understand everything about them. And it's very easy to have some sort of misconceptions brought in because of maybe somebody you heard on online or maybe just because of your own, you know, trying to understand something that's brand new. It can be difficult. So we wanted to tackle some of the biggest misconceptions people have specifically about policy loans. And there's a lot of them. It's, and the reason why we feel like we need to bring it up is because it's something that is brought up all the time. So I guess we could dive into that, Holly, of, of misconceptions. Anything before we dive in that you wanted to share about this? Uh, I, I would say that we get this question a lot, Nate, and that's one of the reasons why we're addressing it. I mean, I can tell you even yesterday I had a client ask me about their policy loan and, oh, can I just borrow it back out and pay it back? The snowball effect. Like, it's going to make my policy grow exponentially so this is an individual like individuals that even have policies but they don't truly understand the process of why you take policy loans or when you can and the misconceptions because everybody has a different viewpoint or opinion on it and I think that's the importance of addressing it is understanding what actually takes place with policy loans and how to actually utilize those with your policy yeah, I agree. Um, and, and the biggest issue with having misconceptions on this is you can do stuff you shouldn't do. So that, that's the case. The biggest misconceptions, the reason why you want to stamp them out is because if you if you live life with the misconceptions as your reality, then obviously you're going to be doing things you probably shouldn't have done to begin with. So as you brought up, Holly, maybe the first one that we could talk about would be the idea that becomes very prevalent that the more I use my policy, the more money I borrow the better my policy is going to grow. This is a common yes. misconception. That, that, and I think us as IBC practitioner teachers, it's, it's kind of our group that's to blame for some of this, I really do think. So oh, we, we'll, agree. you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not even the client's fault for believing this. I think it even the roots go all the way back to Nelson Nash too. Because in his book, uh, in the equipment financing section of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, the book that coined the term infinite banking and really started this whole thing, um, he, he in that example, he went through scenarios where the more they used the policies, the better the policies became. And so that was that puts forth this idea that that of course consumers clients are going to have. That the more I use, just like Nelson Nash says, the more I use my policies, the more they're going to grow. And um, so I wanted to, we kind of want to nip that at the bud and say that Nelson Nash can be right and you can be wrong at the same time because there was some complexity happening under there. So in the examples that he was doing, he was showing how a real life scenario of an individual in the logging uh, business who was financing trucks for the business could take over the financing of those trucks using policy loans and then pay back the policy loans exactly what he was paying the truck folks, the truck financing folks, and end up keeping all the money that the truck company would, would the financing company was making off him. 
And so the numbers look awesome, and, and it goes really well. But below the numbers, you'd have to actually understand what's going on. In, in other words, the, the finance company was charged. This was, by, by the way, back in the 90s. So the interest rates here yeah. are not really that relatable. But back in the 90s, the, it was a leasing agreement, and the real interest rate was, was close to 15%. That that truck owner was uh, using to, to lease the trucks, really. And the policy loan rate that he was borrowing from the insurance company was only 8% at that time. So really what you saw happening was a guy borrowing money uh, from a policy at 8% to take over a truck loan at 15%. And then they were paying back the policy exactly what they had been paying the trucks, which was 15%. So of course the policy is going to grow by more by the fact that they were using it. But that's because of the interest that they paid back. They paid above the policy loan rate. So um, I guess that's where it, it can get a bit confusing. So people just think by looking at that example and some others that you may see online, that if I borrow, that really the key of IBC is to borrow as much money, repay it, borrow as much money, repay it, do, it, do that as often as possible because that's what makes my policy grow faster. I guess, Holly, I've been talking for a while. We can. We're, we're, I'm going to hit this at many different <laughs> angles, too. So I'm going to give it to you, and then yeah. I, I might take it back. But the idea there okay. is that it's, it can be true and false at the same time. It can be true that if you borrow and do what Nelson did in his book, and, and let's say you made an investment. Let's say you borrow from a policy at 5%, and you invest money at 10%, and you pay all of the income that's coming out of that investment to the policy. Yeah, the policy will grow more. But that's not exactly because of the loan itself. That's because of the amount of interest you chose to pay back. You chose to pay back in higher than what the insurance company was charging. And that money actually goes in as additional premium, not as loan repayment, which boosts the values. So, I mean, in a roundabout way, yeah, you can do it by using it. But it, just the idea that borrowing makes the policy grow faster is actually incorrect. Well, and I think, they oftentimes one of the things I tell clients is if you – Repay the principal, how much do you have to use? Whatever, it's the principal. What you borrowed out that you put back in, that's exactly what you have to borrow out again. The same principal. It, what you borrow out and then what you pay back, the same principal amount is the same. The interest is a whole other category altogether. And only in that Nelson example, because they're paying extra interest, which is, like you said, it's an extra premium going to paid up additions. Is there a reason why you see that astronomical growth within the policy? If all you're doing is paying the regular interest rate back, that's actually not making your policy grow. The growth in the policy is because of the uninterrupted compounding. It's yeah. actually not not because of the loan. And the policy would have grown whether the money was in there or whether the money was out. So I think the reality is is that you have to understand that when you're taking that policy loan out and you're repaying the principal, the policy doesn't grow anymore by repaying only the principal. It's that you just get to use that money again. It's that interest that you're paying, and I'm going to say extra interest, this additional PUA that really is what causes a policy's growth to really occur. And that's what people have to understand. Well, the Not extra this, growth to occur. Oh, I took yeah. a loan and I'm going to pay it back real quick. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, yeah essentially, you know, it, and so I've, been, I've had conversations lately too, of course, with people who, um, were, you know, we're taking out policy loans. I guess here's another thing that we could we could discuss in this front. I have so many comments on this. Yeah. <laughs> but another thing we can discuss in this front <laughs> is that whenever, so if, if we have this conversation, so someone comes in and becomes a client of ours, and they have some sort of misconception about policy loans. And so they, they come in believing that there, that there is some, that when I own this policy and I'm borrowing from it, there is something magical happening under, in the numbers that means that the policy is going to grow faster than if I never touched it. And, that, and that's what they believe going yeah. into it. It can come as a shock when I tell them, you know what, by the way, buddy, if you, let's say you took out $100,000 in the policy loan to go do something, and you simply repaid the $100,000 loan with the policy loan rate on the policy, your policy is actually going to look the same as if you had never taken the loan out. I remember when Ray, uh, it can come as a shock, but I remember when Ray you know, was, was mentioning this to me years ago, because he, we know this being... 20 years 
past when Ray learned it, but when Ray learned it, the only thing you had to go off of was the book. There wasn't a whole bunch of education online to get anywhere. So all you had was Nelson Nash's yeah. book. He reads Nelson Nash's book. He goes to see the seminars, but there's no real understanding. The pioneers of IBC had to learn all this to then teach people to have everyone understand fully what's going on. So he believed this. He believed that, oh my gosh, I, ha- I own life insurance policies and I need to be using them all the time in order to maintain the benefit and, or in order to get the growth going. So he would take out loans every month, make repayments yeah. every month. Just, I, I'm going to pull out, I'm going to pull loans out, I'm going to repay, I'm going to pull out loans, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use loans to do everything. Because that's what's, that's what's going to make the policy grow faster. And I'm going to have more money, recapture a whole bunch of this stuff. And he did that for you know a whole year, and he realized at the end of the year that the policy cash value was exactly what it was supposed to be had he not even made all of those policy loan transactions. And that's when things started to click. That the, that the policy loans themselves, just simply taking a policy loan and repaying a policy loan, does not make the policy increase in value faster than it otherwise would. It's the premium that makes the policy change its trajectory. So let's say you're putting in $20,000 a year of premium into a policy and you're borrowing from it to do things. Um, if all you're doing is borrowing and repaying really fast over and over again, you're just going to, your, your trajectory of actual cash value growth is going to be the same as if you were just put premiums and left it there. So the way to get off that trajectory is to inc- is when you're one of the ways to do it is to pay more premium and one of the easiest way the most uh, way that, that people have been doing it in IBC is that when they do something with the policy they may just choose to pay back towards the policy more than what just the simple principal and interest would have been on the on the policy loan that they took, which can add be added in as extra premium, which would actually boost the values faster and start entering a new trajectory. A lot to say on that, Holly, uh, and I, I feel like I'm, I may be going around. I've got so much more to say because even with that being said, I think some people then would hear this podcast and then they would say, well, then what's the point of ever borrowing? I thought we were borrowing to make the policy grow faster. Like, I thought that's why we were doing it. I th- so, so I can understand that maybe that, that can cause some misconceptions. In, in other words, they, for all the people who believe this, they then, then just pulling money out and repaying, pulling money out, they, they, they think it's getting them ahead in some magical way. When they hear that it's not, it can be a bit concerning to them, of course. So I guess the, the reality, though, is the reason we're borrowing, or, or there's still value in creating your system in order to create a scenario where it actually makes sense to borrow and then borrow to do things and pay yourself back because of the, the not uninterrupted compound interest that's going to occur. It makes sense to build your life around this system and then use the system to go do things. We're not exactly just taking policy loans out for some sort of magic that would happen internally that we're going to make more money. So I guess what, I, I guess what I'll stop saying, I know I've been talking a long time, is that it makes a whole bunch of sense for a whole bunch of people to borrow a whole bunch of money from life insurance policies. But the one reason it's not making sense is just because by doing so, it's going to create additional growth internally in the policy. That's that. So there's a whole bunch of reasons for a whole bunch of people to borrow a whole bunch of money. One, the reason that does not exist in there is that by doing so, their policy is going to grow exponentially faster than it otherwise would have. That's actually just not the reason. Well, and I think, Nate, the reason why you borrow money is because of the uninterrupted compounding. You're allowing your, your money in the policy to do more than one thing, and you're able to still use it. But I've heard it a lot, the snowball effect. I'm just going to take over as many debts as I can as quick as I can and repay them back. And then they are exactly what you said, disappointed when they don't see this huge policy growth. Well, yes, it it compounded and you were able to use the money, but all you did was pay it back. I guess what we should really say is Ray did it the wrong way for like a year and then actually realized what really had to happen and take place in order for that growth. And we we say there's only three ways for a policy to grow. And so one of those ways is the extra interest, but it's really an additional premium that's being paid, is paid up additions. And so I think that if you understand that, it's a way for you to control your money and not rely on the banks. But on the other hand, you can't just take a loan out and pay it back, take a loan out and pay it back. It's not gonna change anything within the policy. 
Yeah, and I think the power. I think with all of that to sum it up, what Ray discovered, and what what everyone doing IBC has discovered, and actually what Nelson Nash says in his book, is that the real power of IBC is not in the loan repayments on a policy loan. The real power in IBC is the capitalization of the policies. It is the capitalization yes. of the bank, and that that word just means the premiums we paid in. That's how you capitalize banks. You put the only way to put capital into a policy, into the bank, per se, is through the premium. You do not put capital into a policy through loan repayments. Loan repayments are simply replenishing, you know, paying down the loan balance to essentially replenish the ability to borrow the money back out again, but it is not adding new cash value. So that's actually what Ray did, by the way, and that's what everyone who was doing it 20 years ago who was trying to figure out how do we properly live life as IBCers because Nelson Nash did not make it clear in his book. Um, so you had to learn by doing. And Ray wasn't the only one, but he's my mentor, and he's he was one of the first. to. I mean, honestly, he was probably the first to take IBC to the extreme that, that he's taken it, besides Nelson, who was, who was probably one step even further than Ray at times. But all that to say, what he decided to do was, okay, if I'm going to use policy loans to do things, that's great. But instead of me just paying the loans back really fast... I'm going to take some of that money and use it to pay premium. I'm going to, I'm going to add to the yeah. PUAs of the policy, or I'm going to add new policies to the mix. I'm going to capitalize new policies. Instead of just saying, I'm going to borrow, repay, borrow, repay, and just constantly be taking out huge loans, making huge loan repayments, churning money was not getting him anywhere. It's the premium that adds a new trajectory. So that was the solution. The solution was really, okay, well, I'm going to stop focusing so much. Every time I borrow money to go do something, I'm not going to just pay it back as fast as possible, I'm going to choose to pay it back over time and then use the cash flow uh, that I could have devoted to loan repayment and use it as additional premium. And this is, I mean, it could be essentially what, what, to sum it up, the power of IBC is not found in the loan repayments or the policy loans per se. It's found in the capitalization of the bank. Once the bank is capitalized though, that's where all your money is, of course you're going to be using it to do things. But the power that, that has been created is from the capitalization. That's why Nelson Nash says rule number one is don't be afraid to capitalize. It's rule number one. Most important piece. Don't be afraid to capitalize. <laughs> rule number one was not make sure you take huge policy loans every single year. <laughs> the rule number one was not you know, keep the money in motion constantly without ever stopping. Um, the idea was make sure you pay premiums. If you are committing to a high level of premium, it starts to make more and more sense to borrow because you we all need money to live life but i guess what i wanted to stamp out to some degree was probably the biggest misconception that there is some sort of mystical powers in taking policy loans remember everyone by the way policy loans are simply collateralized loans against your cash value it's just the insurance company is offering you what i like to call an interest only line of credit for life against your cash value you can borrow against this policy for whatever reason, no questions asked, repay it on your own terms. There's some amazing things about it, but I, I think that what, what oftentimes happens is people think that the borrowing itself is what causes the policy to grow. No, the capital in the policy is going to grow, even while the loan's outstanding. It's not, be, it's not the, the policy doesn't grow because I took the loan. It grows in spite of the loan. It grows through the loan. It grows... Beyond the, I mean, it's just the loan does not determine the growth of the policy. The loan is just simply the most efficient way to access the funds that have been accumulated in the policy, and it does so in a way that doesn't stop the growth of the policy. So it is very unique. The system is very unique, but it's just not magical. So that's one thing I'd like to kind of nip at the bud there. How would you like to receive a free physical copy of Ray Poteet's book, The Tree of Wealth, How to Build a Legacy? I'd like to share with you a little about the book in Ray's own words. For a very long time, I was not quite sure what money was or what role it was meant to take on in my life. At the time, I treated money like many others do, with an unwilling respect, a healthy dose of fear, and the knowledge that there never seemed to be enough to go around. Like a mirage, most people can see the wealth horizon although getting there is something entirely different. As a Christian, money was always a gray area for me. I knew I wanted enough to be financially free at some point, but the cost of living was high 
and I felt like I was forced to spend everything I earned. After working hard, my reward was to be able to afford the lifestyle I had built for my family. Of course, when you're not sure about money, it always seems to get away from you. That is how I felt back in those early days, when I still had many money lessons to learn. The good news is that I did learn them, and along my journey, I picked up some incredible insight into how money works and how I could make sure that living from paycheck to paycheck would not become my eternal fate. God wants us to lead a life of abundance, and that is really what this book is about. Now to get your free copy, go to livingwealth.com slash review. You'll then be taken to Apple Podcasts where you can leave us a short written review. A few nice words is all we ask. Then email a copy of your review to info at livingwealth.com with your mailing address so we can send you your free copy of Ray's great book, The Tree of Wealth. The first five people to do this get a hand autographed copy. So don't delay. Go to livingwealth.com slash review. Again, that's livingwealth.com slash review. And I think another thing we want to talk about too, Nate, is the when can I take a policy loan? I'm going to move over off of the loan and we're going to, when can I take a policy loan? And I hear all different responses to that. I hear, oh, I have to wait a year. I have to wait two years. I have to do this. I have to do that. The reality is, is that you can typically take a loan within 30 days of the policy being enforced or being paid per se. Yeah, and the reason uh, I think there's a the misconception there. But the reality is, too, if you're paying a monthly premium, you don't have that much money to borrow within 30 days. And so I think the reality is, is that when you talk to individuals, it depends on each person's situation and how they're paying that premium as to when they can take the loan. But typically it is within 30 days you can borrow from that policy if you've made your initial premium. And that, that you have to wait a year or two years, I think is a big myth that some people say you have to, or it's because of the design of the policy, there is no cash to borrow from. So that might be why you have to wait a year or two years. If you have no paid up edition writer, you're gonna have a zero to borrow from in year one and two. So you really couldn't borrow it. So unless you have that writer on there, you really don't have the ability to borrow on cash that doesn't exist. Yeah, and I, I do think that's the big mis misconception. Once again, based on examples on YouTube, Nelson's book, everywhere you go, people look at the examples and assume that there's something about the policies that you have to wait a few years to use it. It's a big, it's a big misconception, it's, and it's not true. I mean, as you put up, as long as the policy is designed to maximize cash value, which is what it should be, and there's a paid-up addition rider on the policy with large premiums entering into the PUA rider, there's funds to use right away. And a lot of people use policies within the first year, within the first two years. There's no limit, by the way. You have to wait, as you brought up, like maybe 30 days or so for everything to to be processed and ready to go for you to take your first policy loan. But there is not some sort of wait time to use the policies, um, which I think is a big misconception for people who just look at YouTube videos that they think there's you have to wait for a while. Now, there may be a reason to wait. In other words, you may want to do something with the policy and you just don't have enough money in it to do the thing yet and you're waiting until you do. Or, or there, I mean, there's, there's reason. That, that's, by the way, why all of the examples show waiting <laughs> uh, is because yeah. like if we're going to buy a $50,000 car, we're going to wait until we have $50,000 in the policy to buy the car to show this example of what it would look like to buy cars with policies. So it wasn't really because we had to wait. It was just because we were waiting for the example to make sense. We had to wait until we had $50,000 and we could have got there. We could have got to 50 if we started a, a high premium, but maybe we didn't. Maybe we started, you know, a more conservative amount of, of money going in or something like that. So all that to say that that is a big misconception too, is that there's some sort of weird wait time to access policies. Not true. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, the misconception that policy loans make my policy grow faster. Not exactly. Not exactly. As we brought up in Nelson's book, the reason that 
uh, it did grow faster was not really because of the policy loan. It was because as he repaid the policy, he chose to put in more money than, than just policy loan repayments. He chose to pay this thing that is common in IBC circles to be called extra interest. He took over a debt at 15%. The policy loan rate was 8%, but he chose to go ahead and pay 15% back to the policy. 8% of it was policy loan interest. The other 7% of, of the payment uh, would have been essentially additional premium. That's, that's why the policy grew more and more and more the more debt he took over was because of the, the nature of that. But just him taking the policy loan didn't create some sort of magical you know, scenario. And I guess the other one, which we've kind of hit at as well, but is very, very common is that the loan interest that we pay is essentially just depositing the loan interest into our policy. There's a very common misconception out there that the loan interest, when I take a policy loan out, the interest that I pay on the policy loan is just, it just is money getting dumped into the policy. Unfortunately, not true but in a roundabout way, it works because of certain reasons. I'm just saying that that idea is actually incorrect. So remember, you are receiving a, a collateralized loan against your cash value. You are pay- The insurance company itself has to invest money in order to pay you your future death claim. right? So they have to accumulate money. They have to take the premiums you're putting in and they have to accumulate money to one day pay you a death claim in the future. They have to be able to in, create profits to, to for you to have the cash value that they've already promised you. Uh, so they are putting money to work. They are taking our premium dollars and they are putting money to work, mainly through loans. It just so happens that as the policy owner, you have the contractual right to receive a policy loan from the insurance company anytime you want. Nelson Nash liked to say this essentially puts you in the position that you outrank everyone else that they can put the money to work yeah. into. So whenever they give you a policy loan, it's essentially them investing money in the loan to you as opposed to taking the money and lending it to somebody else. So they are investing the, the cash value that must be invested, that they have to go put to work somewhere and that somebody has to pay interest in in order to credit you interest dividends and the future death benefit they, the money has to be put to work so they can either choose to go put it to work elsewhere or they can lend it to you and they're happy to lend it to you because it's actually essentially a risk-free investment of sorts to them by the way so all that to say the interest that you pay is not a deposit into your account though it is crucial of course because it is the income that they are using to be able to credit you the interest they've already promised, the dividend that's coming for the year, and the future death benefit, they, the money has to be working. So it's not exactly just a direct deposit, though it does. it's a part of the system. It has to be done that way in order for your money to continue to compound the entire time and earn dividends the entire time on the full balance. That's because of the interest you're paying. That's what's allowing them to do that, of course. And Nate, I like to tell clients, like, the interest that's due goes directly to the life insurance company. It's paid to the life insurance company. It doesn't go paid into your policy. So it gets paid into the life insurance company. The benefit or the reason why paying the interest to the insurance company works is because you're a shareholder. And that's that's the simplest reason of explaining it. I've also had the clients of why would I pay interest, right? Like... Well, because you're a shareholder, you want the company to be successful. And if you pay interest to a bank, you should pay your interest to the policy loan on your life insurance policy. What they don't always understand is, if I don't pay the interest, I don't have as much cash value. And having to explain the the reasons behind that is the other thing. Well, I can take a policy loan and I never have to pay the interest. I'm going to say that that's another myth of... Just keep taking policy loans and don't ever pay the interest, and then you wonder why you don't have any cash value. So. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So that's another good point. It's said quite often that you are not required to pay policy loans. So people think I can just just let it sit, and I guess you can. You don't have to repay policy loans. You don't have to pay the interest. You can let the interest compound, but it's not. It, I think some people get weird thoughts about that, where they think that there's literally absolutely no consequences at all. Like like everything's going to be perfectly fine, even if I take policy loans out. And never paid. By the way, there are scenarios where it does make sense to do that. By the way, if you're taking income out in the future from policies, I mean, there. I don't want to. I'm just saying that the the myth 
is that there's some sort of weird where people get carried away with it, I guess, where, where people in their mind think, okay, well, since, it, you know, I can just pay it off with my death benefit later. And so they start doing weird things uh, with money. They start doing weird things with their policies. And so you, you're always disappointed to see that. But all, all that to say, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to me that, um, you know, when people say things like, well, why would I pay interest once again? And Nelson Nash talked about this in, the, in his book. He does. The only, it, you, this is not magic. IBC is not magic. What in the world, do, th- do you guys really want a Ponzi scheme situation where you can get an interest-free loan from the insurance company and still have all of your money compounding on the full balance and not pay any interest back? <laughs> is that, that's, a, that's what's called a Ponzi scheme. It, 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 that's nonsensical. Yeah. There are only two ways that the transaction works. Either one, you withdraw money from the cash value and remove cash value from the account, which you are allowed to do, by the way, with a partial surrender, with a, with a withdrawal of money. You, can, you don't have to pay interest. You can take a withdrawal. You can surrender some of the cash value, pull it out, and, oh, and you don't owe anybody any interest. Great, go ahead. But that money is obviously no longer in the policy, compounding and earning interest and dividends. On the flip side, you can borrow against the cash value and pay interest on the policy loan, but in exchange for that, you get to have 100% of your cash value growing and earning dividends the entire time in spite of the loan being taken out. Those are the two solutions. Those are the only solutions. There is no way where you can you can get the money you can have, let's say you have $100,000 of cash value and you borrow it out 50000 You can't have the cash value still growing at 100000 and then not pay any interest on the fifty at the same time and have the insurance company be solvent. <laughs> That's magic. Yeah. It, it, it's nonsensical. It can't work. Of course it can't work. We all know it can't work. They can't give you interest and dividends on money that they don't have anymore. That's not working anywhere. They can't just give it to you for free and then say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll bite the bullet and we'll go and solve it. So of course those are the only two solutions, but I think they get lost uh, in, in IBC because of, because people, you know, start believing kind of odd things, but, um, well, here we are at the time, well, Holly, Any, anything else? It goes back to exactly what you said. They think it's like a magic eight ball that, or uh, the Ponzi scheme is a great example. Like, oh, it's just magic. I put money in, I take money out and I don't have to do anything else. And it just magically grows for me. It doesn't, life doesn't work like that. Money doesn't work that way loans don't work that way in the real world, so why would it work that way inside a life insurance company? The only thing we're really changing in this process is who's controlling the money and who's receiving the interest being paid. That's really the only difference that we're doing in this scenario, which is why you want to use IBC. But to just say, oh, I'm going to put 50000 in, I'm going to take 25000 out, and I'm never going to pay anything back, and I'm never going to pay the interest doesn't make it worked. It doesn't make it magical in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, exactly right. And so, I mean, I guess that's where we can kind of end it of sorts. By the way, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Go listen to any of our other podcasts. There's a whole bunch of reasons yes. that IBC makes sense, that taking policy loans makes sense, that using policies to do so many things makes sense. There's so many reasons, but don't get caught up in some of these misconceptions. Uh, the magic side of IBC that 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 is easy to get pulled into depending on who you watch who you hear about online i mean as i said even reading nelson's book can can offer some levels of confusion of of what it actually is there's so much good in ibc don't let some of the weird thoughts come into your own head of of the misconceptions but also don't let the fact that i'm calling these these things uh misconceptions if you were a believer in those Understand that, by the way, IBC was good in spite of you believing it wrong, and it's just as good now as it was then, but it probably makes more sense now. Uh, you under, uh, The whole point is to understand more and more about what exactly is going on internally to make it make sense. And I know we didn't really dive into too much of that, but I do think it's important that you know our listeners understand that there are some certain misconceptions. If you have them, they will cause and you believe in them, you'll start doing weird things with policies, and you'll start wondering why things aren't going the way you thought they would was well, probably because of one of these, you know, big misconceptions, especially in the policy loan universe, where the loans and the premiums are where every misconception essentially exists. The loan repayments, the loans, the interest rate, the premiums, the flexibility, the base premium, 
the paid position rider, the mech limit. Obviously, these are the complex things that get uh, very confusing very fast. Anything else, Holly? Should we... Well, I just want to say, like, one even of the episodes we talk about, with everything that we're talking about misconceptions, there's a process and there's rules in place that you follow when you're taking that policy loan and utilizing it. I mean, I think we have a podcast on Don't Steal the Peas, Nate. Yeah, which sure is a perfect example of Nelson talking about in his book what he means by that. So if you don't understand, reach out to us, please ask. But there's also a, there's always a process to the reason why you're doing something. If you don't understand the process, reach out and ask because part of being successful in creating this system is following the process and the rules. That's right. You're all right. So infinite banking concept is a concept. If you follow the concept, it's going to make a lot of sense, and it's just as good as what we've said. I honestly believe it's very, very good, but don't let the misconceptions be confusing and think it's some sort of magical system. No, it makes sense because numbers make sense. Logic makes sense. IBC can make sense too, uh, so don't get too caught up in, in some of the hoopla. But thank you all so much for coming. It's been another pleasure to, to, to push out this uh, content. If you like it, if you review it, if you share it wherever you're consuming it at it, that definitely helps the uh, the word get out. We appreciate it so much. But this has been Dollars and Nonsense. If you follow the herd, you will get slaughtered. For free transcripts and resources, please visit livingwealth.com slash e164.